you go. All right. Yeah. Thanks. So thanks everybody for coming out tonight. It's a beautiful day out there, so it takes a lot to come on inside. But we thought that this was a great time of year to talk to you about allergies. Everything out there is turning green and in bloom, and our office has been overrun by folks having trouble. So uh, it's, a, it's a good time to think about all of this stuff. Um, my name's Carrie Brennan. I'm a physician assistant with Ear, Nose, and Throat and uh, Audiology Group. And I've been doing allergy now for about seven years. And I'm really lucky to be joined by Dr. Charn who many of you know he's been doing allergy since I was in elementary school um, no, just kidding. <laughs> he's been doing it for a long time and, and he's a really great resource and we've developed a really good program through our office in terms of identifying allergy treating them there's some uh, new and exciting things that we're doing and we're really excited to share it with you tonight um, we've entitled this talk a new approach to ENT inhalant allergy I don't know that it's necessarily a new approach um, uh, a lot of the things we're doing have been around for a while, but um, it's uh, our approach and uh, we've had a lot of success with it. So before we can get too involved in our talk on allergy, I know we have a little bit of a population bias here, but how many of you in here have allergies? <laughs> so just about everyone. For those of you who don't, do you have family members who have allergies? Yeah, all right. So let's talk about what is an allergy. Um, we all kind of know what allergies are. We know all the symptoms. But basically, the official uh, definition of allergy is a abnormal response by the body's own immune system to a normally harmless substance. So take, for example, our animals, our cats, our dogs, their, their dander, their epithelium, normally shouldn't cause much of a problem. But in an allergic person, it causes a hyperreaction. And so it becomes very problematic. Um, there's a lot of terms out there that we use to describe allergy. Uh, tonight, you're going to hear us uh, say over and over, allergic rhinitis. All our medical terms have to sound so fancy these days, and most of them have itis at the end of it. Uh, when we say allergic rhinitis, rhino referring to the nose, itis being inflammation. We're talking about an inflammatory response in the nose caused by allergies. Uh, um, in our office, we practice otolaryngic allergy, meaning allergic disease as it pertains to the ears, nose, and throat. Um, some people call their allergies plain old allergies, and that's easy, we like that, right? Um, hay fever, any of you use that term, hay fever? Yeah, it's a little bit of a misnomer because it generally doesn't cause fever, and although it can be caused by hay, it's not generally. Um, and I find a lot of people use hay fever to describe more of the seasonal allergies versus the perennial or the year-round allergies. Um, some people just simply say they have sinus, um, and that can mean a lot of things from infectious sinusitis to allergies, congestion, that kind of thing. Um, anyone heard of the, the term catarrh? Uh, some of the elderly folks use that or people across the pond and uh, not necessarily uh, an allergic term but meaning congestion or inflammation within the nose itself. Um, Every talk I go to on allergies calls it the Rodney Dangerfield of chronic disease. It doesn't get a whole lot of attention. It doesn't get a whole lot of respect and, and probably a lot of reasons for that. Um, most of us aren't going to die from our allergies. Um, you know, we, we focus a lot on high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease, but there's a lot of reasons why allergies should uh, be on the forefront in our minds. And if we look at the medical economics of allergic disease and we look at the numbers that it affects and some of the, uh, not only the symptoms, but the quality of life issues involved in it, uh, it's pretty staggering, actually. There was a study that looked at quality of life scores in people with allergies versus other chronic diseases such as heart disease, um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, cancer. And what they found was that folks with allergies actually outscored, meaning had worse quality of life scores than people with some of those major illnesses. And we tend to think of them in different categories, but I think over the next couple of slides it will uh, impress upon us just how problematic these can be. Uh, just numbers-wise, up to about 40 million Americans have uh, allergies, making this the sixth most common chronic disease in adults. 
adults. Uh, for children, it's the most common uh, chronic disease that we see. The prevalence is one in five adults and one in four children. So I think uh, it's common enough that, that it's become a big, big issue. Most allergy uh, presents itself in childhood, or I should say under the age of 20. So 80% of allergens or allergies will develop before the age of 20, 40% below the age of six, and 20% below age three. Uh, the old line of thought that was that you were born with your allergies. Uh, According to this, 20% of the time we grow into them. So we can come into them at any time in our lives, and that's important to remember because many of us are fine throughout childhood and as we go on in life find that they're more problematic. The economic burden of allergies is huge. You guys all know this, right? How, think about how much money you spend on allergy medications, antihistamines, nasal sprays, doctor's offices because you're sick and having some of the complications of allergic disease. Um, $3 billion, it's a $3 billion industry, so that's fairly staggering. Uh, the direct costs involved, costs related solely to the allergies, include emergency department visits, prescriptions, visits to doctor's offices, but we also have to look at the indirect cost of our allergies, and that is lost productivity at work. Um, we know how we feel when our allergies are bad and it's hard to be uh, functional and at our best. Uh, the number one reason to miss work is actually allergies. And that surprised me. I thought it would be influenza or the c common cold, migraine headaches, but it's actually allergies and that's a lot of lost productivity in the workplace. So let's talk a little bit about the function of our nose. As it turns out, it has a function um, other than looking nice and holding up our glasses and causing general misery when we have a cold. Um, first and foremost, we breathe through it, ideally. Um, maybe not always when our nose is congested. Um, but we need the nose. It warms the air that we breathe in. Our lungs like warm air. When we walk out in the cold and we take a breath in of air, sometimes we cough a little bit. We get that airway reactivity. Uh, the nose helps prevent that. Our nasal mucus, which we all hate nasal mucus, right? But it does a good job at adding humidification to the air that we breathe. Okay. Also filters a lot of particles out. There's a lot of particles in the air, dust, debris, things we're exposed to. And the nose helps prevent that from getting down into the lower airway. We smell with our nose, and some would say that's not always a good thing. However, when we talk to people who have lost their sense of smell, it really causes a big impairment in quality of life. Um, it's our danger, it's our warning. If the house is on fire, it's nice to know what's going on. It's nice to be able to smell our food. Smell and taste are so closely linked, many people lose their smell and it will also affect their taste. Our nose also prevents us from getting sick. It traps the bacteria that comes in. Our nasal mucus has components of it that um, act to fight off disease. So uh, despite the fact that it causes all these problems, our, our nose is actually a good thing. And let's talk a little bit about nasal mucus for a minute. Anyone know how much mucus we produce in a day in our sinuses? About two quarts. All right, so, and that mucus has to go somewhere. So our nose produces it, it drips down the back of our throat, and we're constantly swallowing it all day long, whether we're aware of it or not. Now, the allergy folks are hyper secretors, so they're gonna make more mucus than the average person. So that two quarts is gonna go up, and, and that's when we complain that it's stuck in our throat. But mucus is a good thing, we need it. It protects our body. You look at folks with cystic fibrosis, which is a uh, respiratory illness, and they've got a mutation in a gene for one of the proteins in our mucus and as a result they get very thick mucus they have hard times breathing so um, our mucus is good uh, just maybe not so much of it Let's talk a little bit about allergic rhinitis. It's the most common of the allergic diseases that we see and this is a very simplified um, slide regarding the mechanism of allergic, allergic rhinitis. Basically, somebody with a sensitized immune system will breathe in uh, an allergen from the environment, which triggers an antibody production binding to these mast cells in our nose. The mast cells contain histamine and some other inflammatory substances. When they release, they cause inflammation, congestion, and the symptoms that we all know and love. 
non-allergic rhinitis. So not every stuffy nose is an allergic nose. There are a lot of things that can cause nasal congestion aside from allergies. There are structural issues in the nose. You could have a deviated septum. You can have non-allergic polyps in your nose, an enlarged adenoid, but also something called vasomotor rhinitis. Uh, and this can be caused by a lot of different factors, but it's basically a hypersensitivity to the nose to irritants, perfumes, smells, dust particles, can be influenced by hormonal changes. Pregnant women get very congested in the nose due to the uh, elevated hormone levels. Um, anyone have heard of gustatory rhinitis? You may, some of you may have experienced it when you eat, your nose starts running, all right? Not necessarily a true allergy. Okay, um, occupational exposures, uh, irritants, dust in the uh, workplace can cause the nasal congestion. Uh, one of my favorite terms in medicine, rhinitis medicamentosa. Anyone heard of afranasal spray? Fabulous stuff in uh, small quantities. However, over time can lead to a rebound effect in the nose. This is the nasal spray that people get addicted to quite easily. And although it sounds strange to get addicted to a nasal spray, it happens quite often and um, can cause a great deal of problems. So what are the symptoms? We all probably know the symptoms, right? This is pretty easy. Our mild symptoms are localized to the ports of entry. We get a stuffy nose, postnasal drip, postnasal flood, some people call it, um, itchy watery eyes, sneezing, itchy ears, that kind of thing. Um, our moderate symptoms can spread to other areas of the body, generalized skin irritation, hives, respiratory difficulties. Hopefully nobody's ever experienced anaphylaxis, which is a severe life-threatening allergic reaction. Fortunately, it's rare, but it can occur, and that would be a multi-system uh, response. Airway, collapse, shortness of breath, rapid heart rate, feelings of doom, throat closing, and uh, coma and death, so let's not get that. What are our peak pollen seasons in New England? Our trees are March to June, so we're right in the thick of it right now. Grasses are May to August, ragweed from August to October. But we also have some perennial allergies, things that are around all year long. And these are our um, infamous dust mites, molds. Dust mites, do we know about these guys? These are the microscopic critters we'd rather not think about that inhabit our bedding. They really like upholstery, fluffy things. Um, they feed off of our dead skin cells. And uh, as comforting, comforting a thought this is, we're actually allergic to their feces. And you think about people who are allergic to these dust mites, they're sleeping and inhaling these particles all night long. So eight, nine hours of sleep, hopefully a night, with direct exposure to these, and these can be very problematic. Quality of life. We all know about the allergic symptoms. And some will say, oh, well, stuffy nose, not too big a deal. You know, we've got other bigger fish to fry, cancer and whatnot. But when you look at the quality of life issues that uh, allergies can uh, impinge on, it's, it's pretty amazing. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here to some degree, but fatigue, daytime sleepiness, um, daily activity impairment, who wants to go out and exercise and walk when everything makes you sneeze and feel lousy, reduced work productivity. There's actually a term for this, I kind of like it, it's called presenteeism. It means you're there, but you're not really there. You're not functioning at your best. And we've all had those days, but the allergy folks have a lot of those days. It's their every day almost. Um, I found the next one really interesting, impaired cognitive functioning. So as it turns out, when we have allergies, our brain doesn't work really as well as it, as it could. Um, so it goes a little bit beyond the stuffy nose, reduced learning abilities, impaired sleep. If you can't breathe through your nose, it's really hard to sleep at night. Snoring, sleep apnea, all that good stuff, and overall impaired quality of life. 
This is a little bit more on the impaired cognitive function. They've done a lot of studies looking at how people with allergies uh, react on certain memory tests, um, attention, hand-eye coordination, multitasking, and it turns out they all score a lot worse than folks who don't have allergies. The other thing we worry about with allergies is the so-called allergic march or the progression of allergic disease. So we start out with our allergies, our stuffy nose, it can lead to polyps in the nose, asthma, 80% of asthmatics also have allergies, so they tend to go hand in hand with each other. And we talk about a unified airway theory where what affects our upper airway, our nose, our throat, can affect our lower airway and our lung function. Um, a lot of sinus infections, upper respiratory infections, which are, is our fancy word for colds, sleep apnea. In children, we see a lot of ear infections, and as a result, speech and hearing impairment. Uh, when your ears feel plugged, uh, especially in children, this is critical, because if they're not hearing appropriately, their speech and language isn't going to develop the way we need it to, so it becomes a very big issue. So how do we diagnose allergies? Well, some would say it's pretty easy, right? You have a stuffy nose, you have allergies. Well, as it turns out, not so much. Um, first, we take a good history. We ask a lot of questions about exposures, about your past, childhood, associated infections. Um, we do a good exam, looking in all of those openings, ears, nose, throat. We have some fancy equipment that we use. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, in ENT, we love our little scopes that we put into the nose and take a look around. And that's how we rule out any structural defects um, and some of our other causes of stuffy noses that aren't necessarily allergy related. Uh, in some cases, we'll measure lung function by doing something called a peak flow. Many of you have you many of you have seen this. It's a little device you blow into to see how much air that you're moving. Okay, and uh, further testing of the lungs would include some pulmonary function testing. Uh, acoustic rhinometry, that's a fancy term for an ultrasound of the nose. Uh, basically tells us how much air you're moving through the nose and whether there's an obstruction. In some cases, we need to do a CT scan, a CAT scan of the sinuses to further delineate the anatomy in there. If we can't get good visualization in the nose and can't see the sinuses well, we need to see what else is going on in there. These are some of the things that we find on our exams. Um, the inside of the nose gets very boggy looking. The tissues inside the nose swell up. Um, in the throat, we see some signs of postnasal drainage, kind of, we call it cobblestoning, but it's a, a bumpy appearance to the back of the throat. Uh, you can have respiratory issues, wheezing. Eczema is a classic allergy sign of the skin. Some of our hallmarks of allergic disease, uh, the allergic salute, does anyone know what this is? Yeah, so when we're blowing our nose often and kind of pushing it up, we can get a crease across the nose and that's very telling. Uh, you can say to someone, boy, you blow your nose a lot. And they say, geez, how do you know? Um, and you look very smart when you say that. Um, palatal scratching, the roof of our mouth can get uh, kind of itchy and irritated. And so some people will start making kind of a funny noise with their tongue as they try and get to that itch that they just can't get to. And it's kind of a <coughs> that kind of sound. Uh, allergic shiners black eyes. Um, you guys probably have seen that before. Uh, the itchy, puffy, watery eyes. And I'm always looking for people breathing through their mouths. I do this when I'm in the grocery store. I'm walking down the aisles and we see who's mouth breathing and see if I can diagnose allergies. So hazard of the job. Allergy testing. So pretty much all of you have allergies. How many of you have actually been tested for your allergies? So that's pretty good numbers. Um, those of you who haven't should be calling my office tomorrow. All right, and we'll get you set up. I'm a very big proponent of <coughs> testing for allergies. And why is that? Well, again, because not every nose that's stuffy has allergies. And the treatment of a stuffy nose can be very different depending on the underlying cause. As it turns out, just by looking at your noses and talking to you, we're right only about 50% of the time. So when you combine Combine that with some allergy testing, we really hone in on the diagnosis a lot more appropriately and are better able to tailor our treatments. Um, 
We can also avoid a lot of unnecessary treatments, potentially. If you have non-allergic rhinitis, just an irritant, you're not going to respond to antihistamines, and our treatment course will, be, uh, will change. There's a few different ways to test. For those of you who have been tested, anyone have skin testing done? Yeah, OK. Anyone with blood testing? No? Okay. So uh, traditionally, the oldest method of testing for allergies is skin testing, most commonly being the prick test, where they introduce small amounts of the things that you may be allergic to into your skin. Some may call it barbaric. Um, and then we watch and, and see how much you hive. And we're measuring the hive. Uh, the benefit to that is that you're getting instant feedback, instant results. You'll leave the office knowing what you're allergic to, which for a lot of people is really nice. Uh, the downside to it is that you're getting multiple needle sticks and also have to be off of any antihistamine medications for a certain period of time prior to testing. And for some people, that can be problematic. It's also problematic for folks who are a little bit nervous about needles. Um, and it's usually the tough looking guys who don't like the needles. Um, and for those folks, we have a blood test called a RAS test or an immunocap as the um, more recent version of this testing. It's basically testing for antibodies in the blood. And you can pretty much test for anything by blood that you can test for by skin. And this is the type of testing that we do in our office. We have a panel of, uh, I believe it's 18 allergens that were um, put together by a local botanist for things that are endemic in this area. The upside is that you're getting one needle stick alone versus multiple needle sticks. Um, you don't have to be off of any particular medications to have this test done. Uh, for some people, it can be done right in our office. For others, we have to send them to the lab depending on their insurances. Um, the downside to it is that we're not getting that instant feedback. So it tends to be anywhere from a week to three weeks to turn around the results of these tests. Uh, as far as efficacy between the two tests, they're fairly comparable to each other. Um, I, I wouldn't say one is any better than the other. They can be complementary, in fact. Uh, we do have some people who will test negative to, uh, in the blood test and positive on skin testing and, and vice versa. Um, we're going to get into the, the good stuff and probably more of what you came here for and talk a little bit about treatment options for allergies and what the latest and greatest is. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Charnock. Uh, he's going to talk to you a little bit about environmental controls. He may tell you that anyone with cats should be washing their cat once a week, although uh, I've yet to meet a cat who enjoys that. Um, and kind of what we're really excited about in our office, and that is our new program. I say new, but we've been doing it now for two years uh, regarding sublingual uh, allergy immunotherapy. So I will let him take it away. Is, is there such a thing as eye drops that help itchy eyes when you have allergies? Yeah, there are certainly, uh, yeah. Um, the question is, uh, itchy eyes associated with allergies, and are there options for eye drops for this? And, and there definitely are. There's a multitude of eye drops out there, both over the counter and prescription. Um, they're antihistamine eye drops, and uh, I find that you know all of us are different, and our body chemistries are all different. So what works for me may not work for you, and vice versa. Um, but but certainly there are options. There are systemic options such as antihistamines. Um, some of the steroid nasal sprays do have the indication to treat ocular uh, allergy symptoms. Um, although I don't think uh, personally it's quite as good as the eye drops. Um, Anything to, to add, Dr. Chernock? Sometimes you just have to do trials. I'm going to find out how old she was when I started doing this. So, <laughs> so I started about 1985. All right. Okay. <laughs> so a lot of things have changed over the years with allergies, but you know, it was actually first described by the Egyptians, you know, thousands of years ago, and it was, I believe, it was a wasp sting that killed one of the uh, kings, and it was transcribed in the hieroglyphics, and that's when at least in the, our society, we describe as the first allergy reaction. Got to push it or just talk? There you go. So back to the Egyptians was the first allergy reaction that I'm aware of. 
I'll go into treatment, you know, and it, if it hurts, don't do it, right? So avoidance, you know, if you know what you're allergic to, like the dust mites, then you can take measures against dust mites, whether that's these bed sheet covers that are uh, tight enough to uh, try to keep the mites away from you. Um, and uh, there's different styles and brands, you know, they're even at Walmart now and Sears and Kmart, but I would say the cheaper ones are like plastic and they crinkle and you kind of sweat. I'd, I'd go for the more expensive ones that are like a little silk feeling to them because they don't, they're more comfortable. <laughs> um, other environmental uh, triggers, she mentioned the cat, but you know, animal danders, you know, we have a cat, but you know, we don't let them sleep on our pillow. Um, if you have allergies, try to keep your bedroom as your safe environment area because that's, when you add up the hours in the day, that's probably where you spend most of your time is the bedroom. You can help filter the air before your nose does. It's harder in the summer when the windows are open, but a HEPA filter. It stands for a high efficiency particulate accumulator. And that was developed by a guy for NASA. That's what they had in the Apollo program to keep the air clean in the capsule for the astronauts during the waitlist time. Actually, the guy that invented that was one of my patients. He's from Vermont. He got no royalties. It was, it was government. He was working for the feds, so it's, it's, it's NASA. But um, those work well, too. They, you want to get one that's fit to the room size, like an air conditioner that tells you what size room. But you want to turn the air over in the room three to seven times an hour. I don't know what it is set for a building, but they have codes for a building. But that's about the rate for an allergy. Um, pharmacology, that's the eye drop question. There's a lot of different meds out there. I mean, the, the over-the-counter industry is huge for medications, billions and billions of dollars. And when I start, first started practicing, I mean, Motrin just became a prescription, you know, and Benadryl was, I think, the only thing over the counter. Everything else was prescription. Now, Zyrtec and Claritin, they're over the counter. And um, there's multiple generations of antihistamines, so you're hopefully getting less tired. If you take the newer antihistamines, they don't quite cross the blood-brain barrier. In other words, they don't go into your brain and make you foggy as much. That's part of that learning problem on the quality of life. The kids that they tested in grammar school, they were on medications and they just were cloudy from the meds and the allergies. There's many different kinds of nasal sprays and oral inhalers for asthma. We see a lot of asthma. I diagnose a lot of new asthma when people come in for their, their other conditions. And that has changed over time. Um, there used to only be one or two nasal sprays. Now there's, there's probably eight or 10. Um, and they all work in a little different way, but the steroid ones are all similar. You've heard Carrie mention the word inflammation a couple times. That's redness and swelling. Um, that's the congestion runny nose that the allergen is causing, whether it's pollen like we have now on the hood of our car. Um, other thing that can make your nose swell is like a virus, but that's not an allergy, so that's kind of one way to think about it. But these sprays you put into your nose decrease that redness and the swelling and some of that allergic reaction. Um, tablets, um, there are prescription tablets that are not over the counter. Um, they're just newer. I'm not sure they're any better than what is over the counter currently. Um, the old chlorotrimetron tablets, the four milligram ones that are out there seem to work pretty well for a lot of people as long as they don't make you personally tired. Um, there's new things on the horizon for medications for the nose. There's combination therapies. There's now even a nasal antihistamine spray, so you don't have to take a pill. You can actually put the antihistamine into your nose, and that way you don't get tired, but you're putting the medicine where it is, where needed. You know, so um, if you can take a, a spray and get rid of your symptoms, Maybe that's better than taking a pill that's everywhere in your body where you know you have this chemical in the pill in your big toe where you don't need it or in your heart. You have a spray that's in your nose that's topical, just putting it where it's needed, not absorbed into the rest of your body. Sometimes you're too stuffy to get it there though, right? You just won't go in. And sometimes that's a surgical problem just to get the nose opened up. Um, I'm going to see what the next slide is here because I don't want to... Was that it? Is there one more after that? Lots more. Ah, uh, there we go. This occupational one, I f interesting. Um, 
initially I treated a lot of slate workers and those guys had come in with gray slate on their nose and that was really reactive for them. And so just on the job, because they had to work, right? So if we just got them to clean their nose out with salt water, they were cured. Uh, they were much better. Saline, that brings me to the salt water nasal spray. It's a great thing to use in your nose. You may have all heard about neti pots, right? And um, saline sprays. And we have one in the office we call Neil Med, which is a special rinsing bottle. You can make up your own salt water and just wash your nose and sinus cavities out. That is very helpful. Um, I recall earlier days in the, in the Marines where we were with the Navy and the guys would have allergy reactions. They would just you know, put some water in their helmet, suck in their nose and blow it out and they were good to go the rest of the day. You, know? you can't always take a pill or use a spray and salt water works fine. These needle bed systems that you can clean your nose and sinus, they're, they're out at the pharmacy, they're all around. Um, and I met him years ago. Um, you may see that Gary mentioned that. And it's good for a while, but you can't use it every day all the time. Your membranes in your nose only have a certain number of places for the medicine to bind to, and after a while you overload the system. Also, uh, when you take these tablets, they cause your blood vessels to get tight. That's how they work. That's why it's not like you're getting rid of mucus. You're making the membranes in your nose shrink because you're taking the blood out of it. Our nose is red on the inside because there's blood in there, not because it's full of mucus. And so a tablet like Sudafed can help with that. I wouldn't take it at night, cause insomnia. Probably wouldn't take it if you have heart disease. It causes your coronaries to get a, light, a little tight too. Um, this is an interesting spray right here. We haven't mentioned that, but for the runny nose, it just won't stop. You want to go out to dinner, but you don't want to eat that meal and just uh, you know how we, we take a Motrin tablet to uh, like stop pain as it goes to a certain chemical in our body um, it's an inflammation chemical well similar pathway this will bind on to a chemical that makes um, things become inflamed uh, whether it's asthma or nasal cavities yeah, better yeah. okay steroids we talked about that a little bit in the nasal sprays and then for the eye drops and um, these are just some of the brands out there. How many people are using steroid nasal sprays for their nose? Okay. It works um, for most folks, and it's good. Um, you know, you can take a medication holiday if you don't need it every day, but it works. And how many people have asthma and use an inhaler for asthma with their allergies? Anybody using asthma inhalers? Yeah, okay. Similar process. You can have medications that decrease inflammation and help open up your lungs. You mentioned some eye drops. Um, that one right there are some of the prescription ones that might help with you. Now, immunotherapy, that's you know, the part about our overreactive immune system with allergies. And uh, let me see if we go on to a, oh, where should I a clicker to this thing? So, yeah. all right, we'll do that. And you went towards the laptop. Yeah, that works better. So I'm going to uh, back up to one more here then. OK. So the injections or the shots, I have trouble with that. That's where we're at right now. And for years, we were doing uh, injections. And it was helpful for people. What are you injecting? We are injecting the thing you're allergic to, OK? And we're not talking foods, we're just talking inhalants, pollen, dust, uh, mold, danders, weeds, trees, grasses. That is actually a relatively new thing in, this, in the you know, timeline of immunotherapy. Immune means changing your um, immune system reaction to uh, that product or that allergen. The, the drops have been around for years, maybe in an unofficial way. When you look at what the natural paths are doing or the days before there was allergy physicians, folks were using honey and drops like that under their tongue and in their mouth. Well, if you look at the honey, where's the bee been? He's been on all those pollens, right? He's got it all over him. It's in the honey. And so there's something to that. And it does make a difference, I think, in some people. Some of these um, honey extracts that I see come into the office, people are bringing to me. But you don't know exactly what's in it, where that bee was on what flower or plant. Um, 
But when I look at the labels of what they think is in there, it's the same things we're trying to treat at least for our pollen allergies. Um, the drops have uh, been used in this country since about 1940, I believe, under the tongue they started because Let's face it, we didn't start off giving people shots for these things. We started off with some other mechanism. And in England right now, it's all that's actually used for the past 20 years. Most of Europe is doing drops, not shots, because they found the reactions are much better tolerated. There's less reactions. And it seems like the efficacy or the benefit you gain from putting drops under your tongue is probably as good as shots into the, under the skin. And I think the safety profile has shown to be better. There's less of these bad reactions that can happen to people. The anaphylaxis, the wheezing, the asthma. Subcutaneous means shots. It's still the most common. Although I think you know, there's a trend changing. And by the way, um, one of our colleagues that brought us to you know, work with sublingual drops on the tongue is Jim Luzader. He's back here. He's one of the uh, experts, on, uh, Jim, uh, from Wisconsin, I think, uh, originally so. He's uh, come out to join us today, and he's going to be on our panel after I'm done talking to help answer questions. Um, he's been a great resource. Um, I'm going to go down to the m word modulation, immune system modulation. So if you look at somebody that has uh, allergies, and, and a lot of us do, we have a certain chemical in our blood called IgE. And it overreacts to and develops because of the allergies we ingest or inhale. Now, when you give somebody shots or drops, you're trying to change that. Okay? You're trying to make some what they call blocking antibodies. There's different chemicals our cells make. One of them is IgG. Well, it's kind of like a scavenger. When you're giving people sh shots or drops, you make more of this IgG, and it can block the antigen or this pollen before it latches on to your body on the inside and to these mast cells. And also when you get shots or drops, it tends to lower your IgE or the allergic um, antigen, which by the way was discovered about 1960. We didn't really know what caused allergies until about then. And uh, with time, you can kind of shift your allergic response when you're doing shots or drops. It's not overnight. It's like wearing braces. It takes a few years. And we escalate you up. We start off at a dilute concentration and build your way up on the drops. And I'll go more into the dosage schedule in a while. But during that time of modulation, what you're doing in your body is you're also changing uh, your white blood cells, some of them. There's cells in our body that are called helpers and suppressors, T cells. And it seems we have too much of one style when we have allergies. And if we can swing it back to a balance between the T helper and suppressor, even, even swing it a bit to the right, then you'll have less allergy reactions. It seems like kids in America now, we hear more about allergies and asthma. And what they've discovered is kids don't have that, that don't live on a farm like they used to. We live in a really clean environment. We're not exposed to a lot of things like the dirt, like we when little used to play in the mud or have to work outside a lot. So you have kind of a shift to be more allergic. Um, that's a theory that's been around for a while, and it has proponents and, and um, folks who say it doesn't mean a lot. But I think there's something to it, being exposed to things and you know, develop your own immune modulation. Tolerance. I'm just going to step off the track a minute and talk about foods because I think people have some of that on their mind probably. We're not food allergy people. You can't give sh shots for foods. Maybe someday there'll be drops for food allergies. But commonly, you know, it'd be like a kid, you know, they have cow's milk allergy or soy or egg. But after a couple of years, they kind of outgrow it. They, they kind of get a tolerance. Well, what happens is they've modulated themselves. They've, they've done that shift on their, on their white blood cells, their T cells. So, okay. So we just talked about that. 
Lots of research on this sublingual immunotherapy, allergy drops under the tongue. Uh, not a day goes by where there's not a medical article coming out comparing something about that that uh, comes across my desk. Um, and the data is becoming more and more supportive of the topic, and uh, I think it's got a great future. <coughs> so why did we start it? Um, somebody that was doing shots, you know, since 19 mid 80s. Um, Part of it is convenience. People have to miss a lot of work to come in for a shot and sit in the office once a week. They have uh, side effects, you know, and they get swollen arms or they have asthma attacks and they have to get medications for that. So I was looking for a better, easier way to do it. And um, some of my colleagues from the military um, were using this for our troops. So the um, uh, drops under the tongue were given to the uh, Marines and sailors who were deployed for the last 10 years overseas because when I was in the service, you were, we weren't kept in if you had allergies and needed shots. You were, yeah, you were discharged. Now you can keep those people on board and they can take their stuff with them where they travel and still stay active duty. Um, so that got me thinking about this. And then the more we got looking into it, it became the World Allergy Organization, like the WHO, but the WAO, is the recommended uh, you know, safe and effective treatment. And, um, our Academy of Otolaryngology and Allergy started to publish guidelines. I didn't really start doing this till I saw the American Academies of, of our specialty say that, okay, here's our guidelines, we are behind this, here's our protocol. And so um, it made it seem to me that it was a very reasonable thing to do if the national level is approving it and saying it's a good thing. The world level's been saying it for a while, but America hasn't jumped on until just, I would say, in the past several years, longer in Wisconsin. He's got many years experience, and I hope we can hear him talk. Um, so the FDA, um, allergy medicine or allergy drops, a little bit different. The drops are a biologic material. You know, it's that pollen or that dust mite or that dander. The FDA approves those extracts and so you can imagine somebody collecting dust mites, right, and pollen, but they do. And special pharmacies condense them. And what we're doing is we're using that approved extract in an off-label manner. Uh, so instead of giving it to you in a shot, we're giving it to you in a drop. A lot of medicines are used off-label. Uh, matter of fact, 30% of medicines are off-label. By that I mean, um, for us in particular, if you need an antibiotic uh, like penicillin or something, and um, we give it to you in a nasal spray because your infection's in your nose. That's off-label. It's not an FDA approved. Uh, many pills are used off-label for other things. The highest off-label use is actually cardiology. So that in itself is, to me, not a real big deal. Um, and I just bet you it's a matter of time before it's going to become an FDA approved uh, resource for the rest of the country. This is how it works which I talked about before. That is the blocking antibody, this IgG1. That's what kind of goes up. Uh, okay. I don't think we need it. Oh, eosinophils. That stuffy nose. When you get an allergic reaction, you actually recruit other types of cells into your nose to swell up. And those are reduced also when you do um, immunotherapy or allergy drops or allergy shots. We talked about the European experience, long time. The reason they stopped doing it in England because they have a national health service. So, I don't know, it's probably been there 20 or 30 years now in England. It's kind of like what we would call Obamacare in America or one payer system in England. So everybody was tracked. And they were having a fair number of allergy related severe reactions and deaths. And they said, well, this isn't right. And so that's when they switched over to the drops in England and the rate of severe reactions just went right down. So they found it to be what, what they're going to do at their national health care level. Okay. And um, I believe now it's even changed again, the uh, Jim, right? The, the dosing schedule uh, for the drops? Yeah. They've made it a little faster. Yeah. Good. Um, 
And the last thing I'm going to mention here is uh, this is called Cochrane Review for anybody that's going to go and look this stuff up on. This is the kind of non-biased look at stuff that's, I think, uh, I don't know if they're out of Sweden, uh, but uh, they have a group of uh, professionals who actually look at these kind of things, whether it's heart disease or allergies, and <coughs> pool all the data from around the world to see, you know, if it's a really, is there evidence behind this kind of stuff? Is it, is it okay or is there a problem with it? And they've come up with a safe and effective review in 2011. So that was really nice to hear that it got the Cochrane Review approval. It's an at-home therapy, except when you're getting started. We see you um, when your vials come in. Make sure it's you and that you're getting the right medicine. We help you with the first dose and teach you how to do it. And we make sure you don't have a reaction in the office. And then you go home with your vial. And it's an everyday thing. It's not a once a week thing. It's every day. And you start off with one drop under the tongue for a week, then two, then three. Your fourth week comes to an end. You're back in the office for your new vial. At least that's the current system we're doing. We're doing it one month for a new vial until you get up to your maintenance vial. So you're coming into us probably once a month for three to four months instead of once a week. And then we might not see you for three to six months if you're doing well with maintenance. You have to be educated. All our patients have to watch a video, go through a consent process. They have to know how to use an EpiPen. Same kind of pen if you were a peanut allergy person or a bee sting person. You have to know how to give yourself a shot. Not in the thumb, but in the leg. And once we see that you know how to do that, then we let you out the door to do it at home. Has anybody had to use it? Not, not, not that I know of. I don't know. Jim, have you had anybody that recently? No. He's got tens of thousands of patients on his list. Insurance companies, right guys? So codes, well code is like a five or six digit number that means what it is that you're getting treated by the doctor. Well there's no code for the actual drops, so they're treated like a prescription. So that we get them from a pharmacy, so the patient actually gets their drops like they get a prescription, okay? I would say right now in America, most of your prescription plans don't cover the drops. But uh, it probably comes out to, uh, I think right now it's $99 for three months supply. When you add up, and we did a cost analysis, when you add up having to come in once a week for shots, miss work, pay a copay, it was actually much cheaper. Um, even though the pharmacy plans don't usually cover it. So in summary, inhalant allergies, the stuff you breathe into your nose and lungs are pretty common. Lots of different ways to treat it. I mean, if you can just do avoidance therapy and some salt water nasal spray, isn't that the best way, right? Um, I think uh, the uh, sublingual is, is uh, very uh, effective and safe and I'm excited about it. And I think they're convenient. It's home-based. It's almost natural in a way. <laughs> you know, you're giving you something that you have a problem with and it works. You might ask, well, how does this get into your body? I put it under my tongue. So they, they tag those molecules with a little radioactive tracer. And what happens is when you get a shot, it goes into your bloodstream and then ends up in some lymph nodes and makes you have a reaction. Under your tongue, like nitroglycerin or other pills under your tongue, you know, the allergy extract actually is absorbed through the lymphatics with our, your lymph node channels. We have blood vessel channels and lymph channels. And they end up in these lymph nodes right here, these chemicals under your tongue. And they get there relatively quickly. I mean, you only hold the drops under your tongue for two minutes. And then slowly over time, that's where you start to get the, the reaction to the, the medication is in your lymph nodes uh, rather than a shot into the muscle or, or subcutaneous tissues. I think that's kind of a, a, a neat way to get a drug into the body. There's new delivery systems coming out. There's even a new one uh, for the, a patch on the arm through the skin. The skin's very immunogenic, reactive. You know, we, we have hives and skin tests. That's how we do it. So what I'd like to do now is have a panel up here to answer a few questions. We're coming up on our final. So uh, Jim, if you could join us. So uh, my name is Jim Bozader. I work with uh, All American Allergy Alternatives. We're a compounding pharmacy in Wisconsin, and we've been working with Dr. Charnoff for many years to help he and him and his patients uh, for the for the allergy drops. 
Um, I've been fortunate enough to be in the allergy uh, marketplace since I was a young kid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've worked with the companies that have developed uh, new testing uh, technologies and uh, purified uh, allergenic extracts, standardized them, if you will. And uh, this latest development is really one of the most exciting ones where we're advancing the uh, art of the sublingual immunotherapy. So the Europeans have taught us a lot about the, uh, what techniques work best. Uh, I think what Dr. Charnock pointed out was that there are different strategies and different protocols. <coughs> and so the protocol that's employed here uh, uses a, uh, a starting dose that's uh, really mild. It's a, it's a dilution of the allergenic extracts. And uh, over the first uh, 12 weeks, then you take uh, stronger and stronger concentrations and volumes of the, of the drops until you get to maintenance. The key thing from a patient standpoint is to take your drops every day because it's the persistence of the exposure to the allergen that starts to change the immune system. And so the key thing is to take your drops every day and, and that's what will really make the biggest difference. And um, as he talked earlier about the symptom relief, which occurs, can occur before the long-term tolerance takes place. So it takes three years to develop long-term tolerance so that you have a chance, you know, not to have to take your drops for the rest of your life. But you should experience some symptom relief sooner and some patients uh, experience that in the first cycle, in the first six to eight weeks, and some certainly within the first six months. Now, you've, um, we were looking at some of his data. You have like 30,000 people or patient load or something? The number of patients that <coughs> there, there are, there are several protocols that are being used now in the United States, but I think collectively the sublingual protocols have treated well over a quarter of a million patients. And, yeah. you know, literally, if you're counting all the doses that are, have well, been given, yeah. billions of doses without any, like without, any seer, <laughs> yeah, without any severe reactions. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I'd like to do is in a minute or two or a little bit longer if we want to answer some questions. Uh, if people have anything they want to ask, uh, concerns? Yes? Uh, Dr. Charles, uh, at the end of three to five years, are uh, these patients um, experience it? Are the symptoms gone, or is it just uh, decreasing the symptoms? Well, you, we hope that they're I mean, gone. I mean, OK, so the question is, after you complete your immunotherapy shots or drops after three to five years, are your symptoms gone? The goal is to reduce the symptoms. Elimination of them would be great. Uh, there can be no guarantee on that. So I would say about 80% uh, of people feel a significant reduction in their symptoms where they're using less medications and uh, have less um, nasal and asthma allergy symptoms. Uh, but uh, even the best shot or best drop, you, you just can't predict how the body's always going to react. Yes? If you have um, multiple allergies, do you mix up like a cocktail for terms? So that's a great question. So if you have multiple allergies, how do you mix them up or can you mix them up and put them into a same cocktail for a drop? Um, Karen, behind you is a, uh, on the table is a dropper. So, in Europe, they tend to only use one or two allergens per bottle, and actually they're putting them in pills now to dissolve under your tongue. In America, since allergy's been practiced, we mix them up. And that's where the purification process comes in, and they're actually put into a vial like this. And so on this vial, this guy has T1, T3, so that's you know, uh, two types of uh, uh, grasses and weeds, dust mites and an epidermal, um, trees rather. Um, so, yes, we can mix them up, and that's, that's how we do it. We put a limit on it. We're not going to, you know, put 20 in here, but I think we'll go up to about 10. 10 or 12 10 is or 12. usual. Yeah. And um, it's preserved in uh, something called glycerin, mm -hmm. and there's no, there's no formaldehyde in that, so it's, it's very stable. So, yes, that's how we do it. And there's cross-reactivity. By the way, if you have, let's say you've got uh, three, three or four different grass pollen allergies, um, normally you only have to find one grass because they cross-react with each other, except for Bermuda and Johnson grass, I believe. But all the other ones cross-react, like Timothy and Kentucky. Got a question? Is this treatment good for children as well as adults? I think it's probably oh. very efficacious for children. Oh, how young? Well, that's what we're deciphering now ourselves. We're new at it because we're being very cautious. I know the group in Wisconsin and the people in the Midwest go much younger than us. I think our youngest patient's seven. Oh, no. 
seven. Which was a, an arbitrary value that, that we decided on, but. Um, right. Initially it was 12 till the kid came in. I said, okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Now, how, I, I know uh, Todd Myers, the uh, ENT doctor out west who I've been working with very closely, uh, he developed the protocol for the U.S. Navy. And I, I think Todd does uh, kids as young as, what, three or four? Well, two years old is the, is the uh, bare minimum of the, yeah. city of the floor. And because the children at that point don't have, don't have much to of develop a, immune system, a lot right. of allergies, but right. their immune system is in its formative stages. And so, uh, in many cases, uh, but that's really the youngest age. Uh, typically, we're in the three to four year old range. Mm -hmm. Three to four years old. But not, we're not there yet. <laughs> no question? Uh, if you're using the drops, are you still using your other medication? You can still use your other medication with drops, but we would hope that if the drops are doing you a service that you're using less of your other medications. Mm -hmm. um, that would be a goal. Um, yeah, that's part of it. So can you use nasal spray and neti pot for allergies? We recommend it. But both at the same time? You rinse out first and then spray second. Okay. Yeah, that's one of my protocols. I want everybody to spray their nose with salt water before they put in their steroid spray. Well, I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. We've gone five minutes over on a beautiful evening. So get home to your families and thank you for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Jim, thank you for coming all the way out here. All right. Carrie, thank you.